Hi, everybody. Uh, this is the Purpose People podcast. I am delighted to say that we've secured our biggest guest yet, literally biggest guest yet. He is six foot eight. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. So this is Dan Adozi. Thank you so much, Daryl, for inviting me onto this podcast and being the biggest guest. I uh, guess <laughs> must have the biggest must have the biggest impact in this video, right? A hundred percent. We were just talking about shoe size. He's size fourteen. Is that right? Yeah, it, I am. I am. I'm a, I was actually surprised when I discovered I was a size 14. Wow. I'm one size bigger now than I was before. Actually, I was a 13. You just keep growing. That's it, man. <laughs> they say you stop growing at like 21, 25 or so, but... You just keep growing. I just keep growing, naturally, and I can't help it. Cool. So, Dan, we obviously first crossed paths um, watching you play for the Bristol Flyers, um, and of which you were captain at the time. Mm. Um, but there was a whole journey to get to that point in time. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about your story? Because it is a phenomenal story about overcoming adversity and essentially just just making a life where they seem no life and then and to end up where you are. So tell us a little bit about that journey when you've... When you've... Oh, this is a big question. Um, and And also like figuring out where to start from. So I'll, yeah. I'll start back when I was younger and I guess my journey from England to, yeah. to America. Yeah, okay. uh, but obviously I was born here in London and stayed here in London, moved a couple of times like to different countries or different areas. And uh, it was 2004, I was 11. When I was 11, me and my mother, we moved back to America. And this time we never came back. And as a young person, um, dealing with these changes, obviously, like I didn't know what was what life was going to be like from day to day. So I just had to kind of just embrace with the day to day life of whatever happened. So you were born in London? Yes. And then you moved to the United States? Yes. Whereabouts? I moved to Boston, Massachusetts with my mom. Yeah. Um, we stayed there for about three days. And then uh, after three days, we took a bus trip to Las Vegas. Okay. And Still to this day, I don't understand why we went to Las Vegas because we practically had nothing there, no family. We didn't have any ties or nothing. Yeah. But my mom just wanted to go to Las Vegas, so we ended up going. And then... Uh, How old were you then? I was still 11. Still 11, 11 So yeah, old, so right, between... Yeah. My whole story in terms of like where I'm at now has Start happened around between about 11, 11 yeah. to 12. Okay. And so uh, we got to Las Vegas and we stayed in a bus station, obviously for a few hours. And then we ended up going with a random stranger to an apartment somewhere. And we stayed in this apartment for about a week. And then after that, life just took a, a strange turn. So uh, the person that we stayed with, they ended up going on their own journey or in their own direction. And me and my mother were left to like make decisions and figure out where we we're going to go. And the only place that we looked to, because my mom wasn't working and she didn't have yeah, obviously finances was it was an issue. We ended up going to a shelter, and I remember the first day as a kid when we stayed in the shelter, I was like, "Wow!" Like it, it was like a big kind of like hall, yeah, and or like a canteen, and it was just mothers and women with children and stuff, uh, just sitting down and you know not doing anything. Wow. And this is this is in the middle of the afternoon. You know, so I'm thinking like, wow, like. And you've never here. seen anything like never that Never seen nothing like yeah. that. So I was, obviously I was humbled because people here were going through something or were going yeah. through a certain phase in their life, right? So ended up staying in the shelter uh, for about, I don't know, 30 to 60 days or so. Still yeah. going to school in between. And, um, and, and that day-to-day -day life as a kid, going to school, but knowing that you're homeless in the background as well, so not a lot of people see that, you know, and I'm not saying my situation is any different from anyone else at that time, but it was like, no one really had an idea. I didn't even really have an idea mm -hmm. of what, what norm, normality was, but yeah. I know being homeless wasn't definitely one of them, right? So uh, we stayed in Las Vegas, I finished school, and then, which is the fifth grade, uh, which is the last year of primary school. Right, okay. And then moved to Los Angeles, uh, 60 days after, obviously, we moved into Las Vegas. I moved to Las Vegas. Mm. And we come across, when we moved to Los Angeles, we came across, like, various different areas. Like, we'll stay in, a, stay in LA, uh, whether it was in Watts or downtown LA. 
and downtown LA speaking about this area and this environment, like we were staying in the hardest skid row. Yep. Where obviously if you've seen like film or if you've seen like um, certain documentaries about Skid Row, it's, yep. it is what it says it is. Is that is that the east of LA? Where, where is it? North, south, oh, east and west? Good. It's literally in the heart of downtown LA, oh, is it? which is which I would say is central. Central, central okay. LA. So in Skid Row, uh, in in this area, it's like people who have given up on themselves, people who are probably battling substance abuse, yeah. um, people who maybe have hit rock bottom, um, people are homeless, sleeping on the streets. Like this, like if you walk in the area, you see that there's people with like shopping carts on both sides, like like literally on the sides, with a bit of space in between. Some people use like cardboard cardboard on top of that, yep. on top of the shopping carts and like use it as a house and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And you just think like, wow, that's that's tough. Well, I, I cause I, I went to, I think I went to Los Angeles two years in a row and it was in 98 and 99. Mm. I don't know if that was the time you were out there, but we might have bumped into each other. Maybe, <laughs> imagine. Knows, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but the point of it is we stayed, one year we stayed in Hollywood and I thought Hollywood is this amazingly lovely area. And again, shocked at the abject poverty in the area. I mean, Hollywood, you got these stars on the floor, but that was probably the nicest part about it. Mm. You got the Chinese man theater that looks quite nice, but everywhere else, abject poverty. I, I was shocked because I didn't expect to see it. And, and, that, and you know, describing people with trolleys and that, we saw that as well. So we were told by the tour guide, I said, look, guys, you know, you see the palm trees and the Hollywood and this. There's a lot of poverty in this city that, you know, is not mentioned. It know. is. And it's one of those things that you can't take th- what the media talks about in certain places or certain areas and think, oh, yeah, it looks nice. It looks nice. Like San Francisco, for example, poverty there is out of the roof, or out, of the, out of this world. So, yeah, so we did the same. So we did um, Los Angeles. We did San Francisco and Vegas. Mm. I remember going to uh, San Francisco and we stayed in a Holiday Inn and it was on, you know, on the top was a swimming pool, nice, whatever. And then we walked from there down sort of the main high street to what was a Nordstorm. Mm. And I remember walking all the way there and coming all about, and all three of us were just stunned silent. We just seen so many ha- homeless people. So and, and we were like, where have we just landed? You know, it cost us a fortune to get here. We've got this amazing hotel, but we're right in the heart of abject poverty. And it was, it shocked us because the glossy magazines <laughs> didn't show any of this. No. And yet, and, and, and I know now it's even worse mm. in Los Angeles, even worse in San Francisco, 20 plus years on. Um, but you don't expect to see poverty like that in the Western world. No, you don't, especially yeah. in like places where they're glamorized, you think, right? Yeah. And um, But then the media doesn't want you to know that kind of stuff because obviously it might turn you off and yes, make, the economy make and run people right. away and stuff. So it makes sense why you, you think when you, you think of, you have this idea or this picture of a place and then you get there and then you're like, whoa, like you're completely taken away, actually. It's not the reality that you thought it would be when you get there. So, so obviously you're there, sort of eleven years old or whatever yeah. else, and you're in Skid Row and whatever, and then, and then something by from knowing your story, yeah. crazy happened. Yeah, like on a whole level of crazy. Now, at the time, the person that made the decision may have thought that was their only way out, but mm. I'll let you tell the story. But that seems nuts. Yeah, and okay, and I, there's, there's obviously I could. We could jump to that. There's a couple of other oh, things. Go for it, go for it, go for it. Explain. So like, um, so yeah, obviously going to Skid Row, staying there for a little bit, my mother and I, we decided to move back to Las Vegas. Las Vegas okay. And uh, we, again, make it, make it short, but we were staying in shelters. We're staying in random hotels sometimes. Um, sometimes we're sleeping on the streets. Now, actually, our situation is slowly starting to get worse. Yeah. And... Um, after some time, like bear in mind, I was still in school as well. Uh, my mother then decides to move back to Los Angeles. And again, we're going through all sorts of adversity, uh, whether we're sleeping on the streets or this time now I'm sleeping on like random buses or like just trying to stay up at night as a young person because I didn't want to 
go back to the harsh reality in which I was living. So was, my mind was set on like, let's just go on an adventure and take a mind off of things or, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. So what I would do is I would panhandle, beg for money on the streets. And then I just buy a bus ticket and I get on the bus and I just take it. Wow. Or transportation, I just take the bus or trains all day, all night sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and so after some time, uh, I end up obviously meeting with my mom and that. And then uh, we end up going back. Oh, we end up attempting now to go to Florida. And bear in mind, we decide to go on this journey around eight, nine months after we've came to the US. Mm -hmm. So we only came in on a in a 30-day visa. Right. So um or 30 day or three month visa. So when we're taking this trip, I mean it's it's far beyond like someone said, if you guys get caught, then it will end up being the worst possible outcome. Yeah. I didn't really think about it. My mom wasn't taking it serious. So then now we're taking this bus trip from Los Angeles to Florida as we have because we have a family member there. And when we take this bus trip, um, a day and a half after we've left from LA, we get to Texas, uh, stop outside. Oh, we stop in El Paso and stay there for a few hours. And then we get back on the bus and now a couple of hours outside of El Paso, Texas. And El Paso is all the way east of Texas. Yeah. So uh, I, after a couple of hours of leaving the city, uh, we get stopped by immigration. And now, um, I mean, I remember as a kid, like sitting, in the, sitting on the bus and we pull up to this port. And I, I kid you not, this port is in the middle of nowhere. Like obviously it's roads, but it's in the, you look to your left, or dirt fields, look to your right, or dirt fields. Yeah. Like, it's a desert yeah. for hours, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, um, and we pull up to this port, and on the wall it says uh, United States Homeland and Immigration Security or Services, something along those lines. And when I read it, I was like, you get that kind of heartbeat, like, you know, that gut instinct, that yeah. signal. And I don't know what exactly was going to happen, but something told me, yeah, you better watch out for this. So... Officers come onto the bus and they they say from the front, make sure you have your documents. We're going to be walking around, the, the, you know, oh, wow. checking passports and all that yeah, sort of stuff. scary. Get to my mom and they spend way more time on my mom than on anybody else. Yeah. And then after that, that was it. Like they asked us to get off the bus, get our bags. And now um, the bus leaves and now it's just me and my mom and all the bags that we have in the middle of the highway somewhere in Texas going into an immigration port. Now wow. we know that this is trouble, right? So we get into sit, get into the port a few hours um, and then they put us on a van and sh and send us back to El Paso where we stayed in a in a in a shelter or like a refugee kind of house, housing situation. Yeah. And we stayed there for about 30 days. We see an immigration officer in between. Uh, he says that uh, you guys are no longer allowed to be in a country and at the age of 12 all of this is out of my control. So I didn't know whether to be mad, to be upset. Yeah. And I didn't I didn't even know how to process all of this. So I just asked my mom, I was like, you know, now what? And and after that immigration meeting, we decided then to go back to LA, where again things were, if not worse, worse than before. Yeah. yeah. Um, like we literally didn't have anywhere to go. Like only place we were staying in was shelters and sometimes the so streets you're, as well. So you're in this sort of immigration centre arena. So did you, so you left there, didn't you, as far as I was aware? You, did, you left that centre, didn't you? And yeah, we had yeah. to leave, obviously, going back to... So you got flown back to the UK? No, no. Oh, so right. we all, so they didn't, they didn't send us um, to back to the UK after they said that we're deported. Yeah. It's almost like they gave us a chance to kind of figure out how to leave and stuff. Okay. So... Um, anyway, uh, get to LA uh, after being sent back from El Paso and then, oh, sorry, after taking the bus trip back from El Paso and we, again, staying in different random shelters, different places, in and out of, in and out of anywhere and everywhere. And Skid Row being one of them, spent a lot of time there as a young kid and as a young person. Um, and that was probably it. But what happened or what changed was when one day I kind of had to take matters into my own hands and I had to make some serious decisions. So like, this is, I guess this is where life kind of like changed. So like, I just came from being out on public transport all night. Yep. Um, and then I ended up 
going back to where we used to stay in Skid Row is yep. a shelter called Onion and Rescue Mission. And when we when when I got there, obviously I'm by myself as well. And so when I got there, uh I I got there, I just walked inside and I saw my mom sitting down somewhere. And very strange, because some there was days where I didn't see my mom or some days. Is that I, because you were traveling? And, yeah, yeah, I just yeah, get away. Yeah, like I was, right. I was literally just trying to run away and stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah, I had yes. I, I think the most I went without seeing my mom was probably like about two days or so. Right. And bear in mind, I'm only twelve years old. So I know it's mine. <laughs> my kids are fifteen, thirteen, and nine. So you know, I look at them and thinking them traveling around Los Angeles, I'd be like, what the heck? Uh, no, Ter- terrified. Uh, especially yeah. in unknown territory. But yeah. that, but even saying that, as a young person, like, I didn't have a lot of fears. So I just I just went on with it. And I think that kind of helps me in, as in today. Uh, yeah. But getting back to the story. So I met up with my mom. Uh, we spent some time in, a, in, in the shelter that we used to stay in. And uh, we ended up, staying for a couple of hours there, but we wasn't staying there. So we, instead my mom had a shelter or we were staying, what's that, like an organization or at a church that just takes people in, yeah. um, that just needs someone to lay down for the night, like that kind of charitable yeah. work. And um, so we left, we left from the shelter in the afternoon and we were making a couple of turns. Now, we made a we made a turn and we was walking past the shelter that was serving food. And I asked my mom, mom, can we go in here and get some food? And she said no. So now I'm I'm standing or I'm walking with her a little bit, and uh I'm I'm in my head, I'm like, I really want to get some food. I'm hungry, I haven't eaten. But my mom's like just focused on going to wherever she wanted to go to. So at some point I just decided to stop. Right. And you know how kids get, you know, they yeah. stop because they want the attention from the parent. And that's what kind of like happened right then and there. So my mom kept walking. Now, now I'm reflecting, reflect, reflecting and thinking about, do I keep going down the same path or do I just go in here, get some food and just crack on with the day life, yeah, and yeah, life yeah. and yeah. whatever happens. So my mom kept going. She was crossing the street, actually, like. She didn't, she didn't even, I don't even know if she knew I was like right there. Quite frankly, I don't even know if she was aware. So she kept going and I decided, okay, let me go in here to the shelter, get some food and then just see how life goes from there really. And um, went into the shelter, got some food. Obviously my mom never came back and turned around. And 20 minutes later after eating some food, I come out of the shelter and I kid you not, this is all I had. And this is what I had most of the time, actually. I just had a trash bag, like 150 to 200 gallon trash bag just filled with clothes. Wow. Like no money, no phone, no bus passes, no ID, no Just nothing. on your own. Just on my own with nothing. Like, and I, I even just thinking about it now, it's like 12 years old at rock bottom. You know, yeah, yeah. rock bottom, like, I don't even know. I wouldn't say, like, I'm still trying to fathom that. You know, mm. that's it's like, dang. Like, I remember so that. So, so you you're on your own. Your mum is obviously gone. Yeah, gone. And she she just goes home. Does that, that she goes flies back home at I, some point? Or so she got deported, didn't she? Yeah, that, she yeah, got yeah. deported. But this, but, but lead, even leading up to that point, so um, I'm outside of the shelter now, and uh, I, I'm, I make a right and then I make a left. Obviously, I'm just walking through Skid Row as a, as a 12 year old, and I get to the corner of a street, and what I see next is unbelievable. I see that my mom is on the bus heading to where she wanted to go to. So, as a kid, I'm thinking, all right, like, what do I do? You know, and I look to my left, and I see that there's a bus up down the street. So I'm thinking, okay, do I run to the bus? Does my mom get off the bus? Instead, here's what happens. So when I saw my mom on the bus and the bus got to the bus stop, I saw no sign of my mom, right? Like didn't come off and I didn't run to the bus. And then after maybe a few minutes, uh, the bus shoots off and it's gone. And I'm standing there as a 12 year old, like watching this bus go, go, go. And now it's out of sight. And in that moment of time, it was like now, I'm really on my own. Like I really have to see 
how to see the situation through. Yeah. So I didn't know. I, I didn't. Uh, to be fair, I don't, if you ask me how I felt in that moment, it felt like it wasn't. It it, it was tragic, but at the same time, it was. It was confusing. It was uncertain. Didn't know how to feel about it all because it's been many days where I haven't seen my mom. So yeah. maybe I'll see her eventually. Maybe I won't. But I guess for that to intentionally happen, I was like, okay, you know, I'm 12 years old. I got, I got me. That's it. I got yeah, me yeah, for yeah, now. Yeah. So I'm looking around the, the area or looking in the environment. Obviously, there's people across the street that are doing something, who knows what, people sleeping around. And you just I just look in the environment here at rock bottom. And I, I couldn't go any more lower than where I'm at now. So literally, I just... Um, so so interestingly, because that you obviously can't go any lower than you are. You've got all your stuff. Did you give any thought to the future or was it like, I've got to survive now? I mean, what, what was in your head? You know? In my head in that moment, I was just like, I need to find somewhere to sleep. Yeah. That was the first thing first. So did you go back to the shelter that you got food from? Or No, oh, so because okay. I, I knew the shelter that we used to stay in, they wouldn't let any, they wouldn't let kids come in and stay on their own. Right, okay. You know, so I ended up having to just walk around and I came across three shelters and I just walked in and said, hey, excuse me, I'm looking for someone to sleep. Do you think you'd be able to help me? Until the third one, all three of them turned me away because I was under the age of 18. Right. So I was like, dang, you know, and that's a pure test of determination, isn't it? Like, mm. I want to, I want someone to sleep. I'll, I'll be damned if I'm going to sleep on these streets tonight, you yeah. know, as a 12 yeah, well, year old. As a 12 year old, yeah. yeah I was, I'll be damned. I want to sleep in the bed, you know? Yeah. So, um, the, but the third shelter, they, although they turned me away, they was, they was eager to help out. So they started asking me questions like, oh, where's your mom? Where are you staying? Uh, and all and so forth, and I told them what had just happened. And they said, "Oh man, you shouldn't be here on the street." So they end up trying to help me out by finding a shelter um, that takes in teenagers. Unfortunately, they were full. Um, obviously, they called the police, and uh, I'm just thinking about them typing my name in, and if they type my name in, saw what's happened, you know, that it, it's like, wow, they might ship me back to immigration. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. However, that that obviously that was like the fearful side of things. Yeah. But I'm just hoping for the best. Yeah. So police come and pick me up. We go on a search for my mom. Can't find her, and so get to the police station. We ended up sitting there. Or I ended up sitting there for like five hours. Like haven't been eaten. Um, I haven't eaten, and now I'm like, I, I if I don't know what's next, I don't know what's next. Right for the next for the next, for the time being. Mm -hmm. However, by the end of the night, there was a social worker that came in to the police station, picked me up, and uh, he told me now I'm in the foster care system. I was like, wow, okay, complete 180, you know, like, and, and that happens in life. Like sometimes you might make a decision and the decision that you might make may be tragic for a brief period in time, but actually it might be the best decision for you. So, yeah, but I mean, you've gone from like being completely alone to now being in a new system, like mm. a completely new system, a new world to some degree. You're now almost treated like a citizen of the United States of America. Um, and so what happens next? Do you get placed with a family? Yeah. And, and, so And obviously then there's not only being placed with a family, but and you, you pick up a basketball. Yeah, so after um, being told I'm in the foster care system, I only moved homes once. So I yeah. went from Riverside, which was only temporary, to then staying in Compton. And um, I, I stayed with a family, and obviously they did the best that they can uh, during that time, which is which I'm grateful for. And uh, yeah, I ended up... Ended up being a everything that I was experience that I experienced in terms of like the deportation case, uh, that was overturned uh, after some I think about a year or so because okay. my social worker ended up ended up uh, finding an attorney to advocate for me in my situation. Okay, and, 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 and to stay in the U.S. Yeah, yeah stay in the okay. U.S. So I ended up being given a green card, uh, social like a social security number. Yep. You know, just. Feel like I could live there finally without having to. Worry and how about old were you then? I was twelve. Twelve. Twelve, okay. 12 going. So twelve going to thirteen. Yeah. yeah. 
So, um, yeah, now I have a bit more stability. I can focus a little bit better. Now I'm in school. I don't have to worry about moving. I, wor- I, have to wor- I don't have to worry about food and all that sort of yeah. stuff. And so now, um, at this time in my life, I could actually focus on what I want to do. Well, at least be introduced to more fresher experiences, opposite. Of, yeah, opposite yeah. of completely, completely so, opposite. So you're in, you're in you're in a foster foster situation, foster care, and you obviously placed with a family. And yeah. then, how do you? Because obviously, knowing the size of you now, um, <laughs> you are a basketball player. You're the size of one. But when did you did you play basketball before, or is it just something that you started while you're out there? Or uh, so actually, when I was here in the UK, I was playing a little bit of basketball in school. How, uh, by the way, how tall were you then at twelve? At twelve, you'd be surprised. I was like six foot, six foot one already. Wow. Six. Yeah, I was probably like between five ten and like six foot one already. Wow. Yeah, I was quite big already. But <laughs> um, yeah, so I was playing basketball here in the UK, um, in in school in in England, in London, obviously when yeah. I was here. Yeah. And I didn't take any of it serious, and I was just like, oh, it was just something for fun. And then uh, when I moved to America, I started playing a little bit more basketball. Although I was still into like football and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but basketball seemed to be like what some adults, because when I was obviously homeless a little bit, there was like a youth club around the area yeah. where kids could come in and like play video games or play basketball, whatever. Um, so then they had like a basketball team and they they encouraged me, oh, you, can, you know, come play basketball for the team and stuff. Like, we'll go to the park and play some basketball somewhere. Yeah. I was like, okay, sure. And then I ended up going, playing some, playing with that youth club and then going to, like, a random park and playing against other group of kids, mm-hmm. um, which was cool. It was fun. Um, so then after that, I started watching a little bit of, like, NBA basketball. So I had, like, I guess the shelter had, like, a mentor, like, okay. to help, like, yeah. kids inspire or whatever. And he put on some, like, some basketball games around that time um, when I was homeless, obviously, like, was that 2005 or so? Okay. And um, I was like, oh, okay, that's quite interesting. I wasn't even, I still then wasn't even into it, but I, I watched, I, I enjoyed the games. And then, um, who was, was your team? What team did we watch? I feel like it was Lakers and Cavs. Was so, watching. did you start following the Lakers? And, no, I didn't. I, I didn't even okay. know LA. Listen, I didn't know yeah. nothing about LA basketball, basketball in LA yeah. till I was like 14 or 15. Wow. I didn't know nothing about basketball in the US. Quite big teams in <laughs> Los Angeles. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even know it as well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is yeah. funny. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, that, during that time, I was playing basketball a lot in my shelter, in, in a home situation, which, yeah. was, which was cool. And then, yeah, when I got into the foster care system, then I, what happened? What did I watch? I started, We started watching basketball, like, as, as because it's like a family thing, obviously, to that family. Yeah. And and um, I think I watched, it was like, it was around the time when it was the playoffs, isn't it? So, yeah, it was when uh, Los Angeles was playing Phoenix in the first round. And I think it was like the fourth game third or fourth game, uh, Kobe Bryant hit, knocked down a game winner, um, a fadeaway shot, which that's that was like his signature move. Yeah. But to see it as a game winner, oh my God. Like watching it on TV, I felt I felt the energy. Yeah. Like it was that, it was, it was, it was a very electrifying and passionate kind of like crowd. And like what what I watched and what I witnessed, I was like, that is mad. And then after that, I was like, yeah, I want to play basketball now. And then obviously it inspired me to play basketball, along with focusing on my schoolwork and like trying to figure out what I want to do in the future and stuff. Like I heard a lot about playing basketball on a college level. Yeah, like scholarships and Scholarships stuff like that. and yeah, stuff. Yeah. Like you get your education paid for and all that sort of stuff. So I'm like, all right. So then put a bit of work and time in to playing basketball and I always played at like the park, played after school, played for a club, played for my high school teams, played for an AU program. Mm-hmm. And obviously basketball was like, more like a vehicle, you know, yeah. like something you could use to help you produce or help you attract positive outcomes and opportunities. And that was my mindset around it. So then as we move forward, um, I finished high school, graduate, and do fairly well. I mean, even looking at that from where I came from, 
you know, from, from like, I know, the it's story, just nuts. To then having that, I'm like, wow, like, I started off from nowhere, from nothing. With a bag, nothing. Nothing. Uh, like, and literally now rock bottom. Wow. Now I'm here having a high school, now I'm here, now I'm here, I have a high school degree. Yeah. And I have a basketball scholarship to go play uh, basketball as, as, as an 18 year old. So moved to Texas um, and play for a college. Okay. So then in America, there's college in, in this university. Mm-hmm. This, this system is called a junior college. Okay. Okay. So in America, there's four years of completing your, um, your undergrad. Yeah. You have your freshman, junior, uh, freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior year. And junior college was the first two years of my university experience. So that's okay. so my junior college covered my freshman and my sophomore year. Mm-hmm. I graduated from the junior college and then I moved to um to another university to finish off my junior and my senior year and that's right. four years. Okay, so I went to a college in Texas called Tyler Junior College. Lovely 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 experience. Um both I guess it introduced me to the dynamics now of being independent being alone and 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 now having to work with people around you. Yeah. And I didn't I didn't mind it because I guess everything that happened in life before has prepared me for this moment. Yeah. Now, you know? So mm-hmm. I, I didn't get homesick. I didn't I wasn't like, oh I miss home. I need to move home or anything like that. I loved it. <laughs> I wanted to get the heck out of Kel- of, of 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 LA and go and experience the world yeah, type yeah. of thing. So, um, but yeah, after after two years at Tyler Junior College, I then moved to Iowa State and played for another two years. And again, experiences were amazing. Um, even though maybe as a player, it could have been better. But I'll say like overall, uh, in terms of what we experienced as a team and as a program, we were highly successful. So, so yeah, so Iowa State, you've played um, and <laughs> amateur sport in the United Kingdom to amateur sport or college sport it's just on a whole different level would that be a fair assumption to make in, yeah in america because of the scholarships bigger crowds that sort of thing whereas here it's standing on the park with the players <laughs> and there's no one else around if you're playing football for example yeah that is very true you know um, you had a bit of a setup there right there's in people you had your fans you had followers and that sort of stuff yeah yeah absolutely and that's the thing like fans um we we'll, every night we're playing in arenas and most places are sold out. I mean, you're, we're talking anywhere between ten to like twenty thousand uh, people a night. Just a basketball game, you know. It's, wow. it's, it's, and how old were you then? How how old were you been? Oh, uh, at this point now, I'm like twenty one, a twenty, twenty one, okay. twenty two. So, yeah, it was. Uh, so then, what happened? So, so you're in, you're in, obviously Los Angeles. You're playing for a while. It's like twenty twenty one. And and Iowa. then, did, sorry, I mean, Iowa. Cool. Iowa State. Iowa State. State. Yeah. yeah. So then, so then, what happens then? Because some people would say, well, that's a you know pathway maybe to go to NBA. Yeah. Or you ended up in the UK. So what what happened from that point to get you to the United Kingdom? Because that's kind of where you Okay. So after I finished uh playing at Iowa State, um, the decision was to either find a job and make money and obviously grow a life from there, or you keep pursuing sport and seeing what kind of opportunities come about. So I know I wasn't going to work a nine to five. Yeah. And I still know I'm not going to work a nine to five now. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I don't want an office job. Um, I didn't want an office job at the time. So I just thought, all right, let me keep on playing basketball. And on top of that, I'm still young and I have an agent so I could find an opportunity somewhere. So I decided to go to Las Vegas, play in this like showcase. And the team that I played for knew the head coach for the Bristol Flyers now. Yeah. So okay. he put me in touch with him. And then obviously, like, I met, I, I found out kind of the start of my college whole experience that I have two siblings and they're oh. both here in the UK. So one's in Bath. Well, she's in, she's in uni now in Exeter and the other one's in London. Okay. And I also have my mom here as well because she ended up getting sent back right when I went into yeah. foster care. Yeah. So I thought, all right. I have this opportunity to come to Bristol to play for ba- play basketball here in Bristol and also connect with like some people around. And at the same time, I also have the opportunity if I wanted to pursue basketball further, I have an agent and I could go play in Europe somewhere. But I had a decision to make and I had to think about what was more important and what I've what I've what I feel like would be the right thing to do. 
So I decided to um, take the offer that Bristol Flyers had offered and what they put on the table. And not just for basketball, but because I wanted to connect with my siblings and stuff and all that. And um, yeah, that's how I ended up here in the UK. And I guess that was my kind of spiritual godly pathway and a sign really. Yeah, so you're, it's almost like a redemption because then you reconnected with your mum, is that yeah, correct? Recon- yeah, reconnected with yeah. my mum, also connected with my siblings as well. Um, and even reconnecting with my mum on the, the first time I came to the UK, that's another story in itself. Yeah. Uh, but came to the UK, uh, reconnected with some family and stuff. And um, yeah, and I, I, I focused on basketball a little bit more. And then I started thinking about life, life after sport. And... I say like during my time playing basketball as a professional athlete, I was given an opportunity to represent England yeah. in the Commonwealth Games, which was um, again, which just kind of put the cherry on top of the ice cream in terms of like even from where you were where to I, where you where are I'm now. Exactly, it's like yeah. this is mad, you know. Yeah. I guess there's nothing, there's nothing that I can feel but be proud of like my journey and where I've came from and and the stuff and like just reflecting and thinking about those hard times and 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 all those like moments of adversity is what prepared you for where you are now um because yeah. i've I had to fight a lot as a young person well you, you i i i said this way it's like your adversity was your university yeah you know it. and you graduated from <laughs> from, from, it. <laughs> from it um to 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 sort of em, embrace a new life but what I find interesting is because you captained the Bristol Flyers yes. um, and you've done really well with them. And then you made a decision that you want to do something else. But I think having known you and having connected with you is that you've got all this backstory. Basketball, as you said, was a vehicle. Mm. But you feel as a human, you have a lot more to give than just basketball. 100%. Man. And I think that's where we find you the story now isn't mm-hmm. it where you are looking to encourage and help and mm-hmm. promote so tell us tell us a little bit about what you're doing now having been through all that journey what what what, what are you doing with all that stuff uh, oh man i'm just trying to make a positive impact and make a difference really um in terms of like occupational wise what i'm doing i say i'm doing quite a, quite a little bit a little bit now actually so i'm looking to build a whole new in school basketball mentoring program okay along with basketball opportunities on the weekends to give kids something to do along with now looking to build a new basketball club in Bristol for young for young kids obviously good and then looking to take all the experiences that I've had with basketball and obviously present it with kids so um the house of elite basketball is essentially my main focus yeah and now that I made it I've made it a community interest company nice so yeah. looking to find ways to build it like you know and i'm literally looking to build it to deliver a positive experience for young people but i think what what i like what you're doing now is you're you've taken that sport and that thing and the resilience and those lessons and you're you're trying to take a whole load of people with you and out of their situation into something better and great 100 using the vehicle of 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 basketball so dan you know in terms of the elite house of basketball um just explain when that happens and, and what what happens there. Well, it's already happened. <laughs> no, is it weekly? Oh. Is, it, is it like on every? Is it every Saturday? How, yeah. does, how do people join it? Or are they are they part of it? Or, yeah. Or so it I just we just started like last year. Essentially, we're focusing. I'm focusing on the in school mentoring program. Yeah. Along with the Saturday sessions, uh, which is every Saturday, and yep. then during the term we always have a camp, and we always have a camp also in the summer as well. Is that open to anyone? The camp? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's okay, open cool. to anyone. Like, just come, you know, come along. Have some have some fun. Um and obviously I make sure like kids have a good experience. So it's like we make sure we have food there, we have water, music, games, you know, yeah. all this the sort of stuff you can have in the camp. And yeah, like I said, deliver a positive experience. Um, so that's every Saturday. And then like this year we're also looking to now develop a central venue league, uh, where kids literally open op- just open open run. We call okay. it open running basketball, which is like anybody just come along, bring your own team, or bring your friends and just come in and just play. So, where's your home currently? Where do you where do you meet? Where where you meet? Where, where where the courts that you play at? Where? It's in called Saint Saint Paul's Community Community Sports Academy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and yes, like I said, it's every Saturday. It, it, 
I think they're going to be doing a bit of work to it. Improvement yeah. work, which okay. is great because then it'd be another so home ground. when we relate that back to purpose, because I mm. think you've almost discovered a vehicle and now you become more purposeful in helping other people come out of that tough situation. Yeah. So you've almost like taken the adversity and and create that sense of empathy with people going through tough times as well and say, look, if I've done it, I can take it's you through it type yeah. thing. Um, what would you say is your end game purpose? You know, would you say it is about making sure that other people get the second chance and third chance where you didn't get it? Mm. Um, is, is that the goal? How do you, how do you see life? How do I, how do I see it? Oh, how do I don't see it? I guess that's the question. Uh, what is my end goal? I say my end goal. Yeah. Just to, like you say, present opportunities or give people opportunity to, to 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 find the positive in the situation mm -hmm. or at least help them to find that positive um outcome in the situation yeah and i guess i i really enjoy working with like young people and kids and stuff and just having fun i mean i'm a big kid myself to be fair so <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah uh but yeah working with working with kids and then um yeah really really i think my my biggest one is like building a club that takes kids to like different countries and oh wow cool and go play in different basketball tournaments on top of also we have a pathway if you're interested in going to university in America or you want to go play somewhere in Europe we have that as well wouldn't that but be a great story be... you going back to LA with a team yeah that would be so oh my that'd god that would be so sick that'd be a, in a... fact the program that I play for um which is called I can all stars uh which is an AU program that's what they essentially do they so in America, they have this thing called AAU. Yeah. And what it essentially it is, is like during the summer holidays when school gets out or when school finishes in like May all the way up to like September, there's that big gap of time. So yeah. especially if you play basketball, um, there's an opportunity to go to different to go to different states or even in the state that you live in to participate and play in like basketball tournaments. So think about it from the biggest peak, the biggest time of the year is between July, like start of July to like maybe mid August, and there's basketball tournaments happening in almost every state in America. And you think if each state has, I don't know, ten to fifteen big basketball tournaments, I mean, you do the maths. Think about how many teams is in yeah. each each state playing. So, but it, but it's it's again giving giving children and kids an opportunity, a, a, a sense of a family that might not have one like mm. yourself, you know, you, you obviously found teammates as, you know, from a kid being almost like your family somewhat, you know, playing with them on a regular basis. And I, I love the fact that you, rather than say, right, I'm done with basketball and I move on. You're like, no, 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 this is a great tool mm. to leave an impact and build mm. a legacy. And I think Dan, that's, that for me is inspiring. And, and, you know, I, I'm with you. I love to. I love to hear that you say, Daryl. We are flying to LA, and I'm taking a team because that ultimately is almost like the full circle of the journey. Mm -hmm. To say I was abandoned, and now I've brought everyone back with me, which would be mm. an amazing story. Mm. Um, Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Is there any any sort of like hints or tips or something that you could as like a a leave behind for someone going through a tough time right right now? What would you say to them? What would I say to them? For anyone going out, for anyone out there going through a tough time, um, like your tough time is like a storm, you know, like your storms don't last forever. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of you embracing the storm, finding the positives in the storm. So then when you get out the storm, it's like you can kind of breathe again. You can see the sunlight in the situation. Uh, and that's, again, that with, with my experiences and stuff, like I knew that my adversity was just, I guess, a brief period of time. Yeah. Right? But I hung in there. I didn't give up. I didn't give in. Yeah. I didn't throw in a towel. I didn't get mad at the world. I didn't complain. I just humbled myself and I just took it one day at a time. Yeah. And the more you do that, take it one day at a time, the more you begin to see the sunlight in the situation. Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on. I'm sure we're going to have you back and I'm sure you've got more stories to tell. But um, thank you so much. No worries. Thank you so much for having me. Can, can, um, where could people get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you? Where, how would they find you? Instagram page, uh, website, um, Facebook. 
Or yeah. what, what, what is it? House of Elite uh, Basketball? You, you can type in my personal name, okay. which is Daniel Adozi, yeah. or D Adozi underscore 42. Yeah. Or yeah, you can find me on House of Elite Basketball page as well. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. No worries. Thanks so much for having me. Hi, everybody. My name is Daryl Irwin from the Purpose People podcast. We'd just like to encourage you that if you're following us on YouTube, please like and subscribe. It really helps us get our message out there. In terms of if you're listening to us on Apple, Spotify, or Google, you can leave a review, which really helps us get the viewership up. Um, one of the things that we can uh, give you for free is to try the Purpose Questionnaire. This basically helps you score where you are in building a business around purpose and living life on purpose. Because ultimately what we want to do is help you make purpose a priority. And those people that make purpose a priority are always on our podcast to encourage you that you can go for your dreams and live a life that you really intend. Thank you.